Ryder House is a 17-storey high-rise block containing 64 flats in the Greets Green area of West Bromwich in the metropolitan borough of Sandwell. The block is one of several built in Sandwell by the local authority in the late 1960s. In the late 1990s, the block became increasingly unpopular with residents, prospective tenants and neighbours, despite local authority investment and improvements, so Sandwell took the decision to demolish it. A feasibility study was commissioned to consider the method of demolition to be adopted. Due to the height and locality of Ryder House, it was recommended that the safest method of demolition would be by controlled explosives. Tenders were invited and following evaluation and appraisal of bids and method statements, the contract was awarded to Coleman and Company Limited, a local contractor experienced in explosive demolition techniques. Following the contractor's appointment, a coordination team is set up consisting of Sandwell Housing and Engineering staff, the police, the highway authority and the contractor, including the explosive engineer. The team also includes the health and safety executive, the ambulance service, the fire authority and any other bodies that may be affected by the works. The team decide on the date for blowdown and the explosive engineer confirms the exclusion zone to be implemented on the blowdown day. The exclusion zone is a safe area that is established around the block and all properties within it must be evacuated on blowdown day. From this, road closures and traffic diversions are planned. Works commence immediately to inform all properties within the zone and to gather information of any special needs or requirements. Meetings are held regularly in the period up to blowdown to update and consider progress and identify any potential problems. Works on site commence approximately 12 weeks prior to blowdown. During this period, many skilled personnel and technically competent professionals work on the project to ensure its success. The block is initially stripped of all internal fixtures and fittings so that only the structural elements of the building remain. Once the soft strip has been completed, works commence on the pre-weakening of the block. The explosives engineer submits his design proposals for approval indicating the number of blast floors, the areas for pre-weakening, the number and weights of charges and the initiation sequence. Pre-weakening is the removal of sections of reinforced concrete walls by machine. Once the blast floor has been pre-weakened, the remaining structural elements on that floor are drilled in advance of the placing of explosives. To confirm the explosives engineer's proposals, it's necessary to carry out a test blast on a structural element early during the contract. Only immediate premises are advised of the test blast, as there is no danger to the general public. The test blast will confirm that the proposed charges and at source protection are satisfactory. The explosives will cause the structural element to fail and the protection will contain the displaced material. In this instance, a column has been selected. It is drilled and wrapped in heavy gauge wire mesh and geotextile. This offers at source protection and ultimately helps to contain the explosive effects on the concrete. The explosives are placed into the drilled holes and stemmed with quick setting cement, which maximizes the explosive energy of the charge. Witness boards are strategically placed to show any signs of damage following the test blast. Very little material is expelled during the test blast and the majority is contained by the protection. When this is removed, the total disruption of the concrete column can be seen and the witness board show no sign of damage. This proves that the proposals are satisfactory. The explosives engineer identifies the number of blast floors in his design and following the test blast, each of the 100 or so structural elements are drilled and wrapped. Secondary protection is introduced on all external openings on the blast floors in the form of geotextile. In the week prior to blowdown, activities on site intensify with months of intricate planning being implemented.
the explosive engineering team begin to charge the building with explosives. Explosives are placed into the drilled holes and the holes stemmed. On the day of the blowdown, some 300 people work to ensure the project is a success. Staff meet on site at 5 a.m. and all are inducted and issued with appropriate equipment, including digital radios. Staff breakfast early and in shifts to ensure the operation runs smoothly. Heavy plants and equipment is delivered to manage and clear the rubble pile. Road closures and traffic diversions are implemented. Control team meetings are held every hour in the police control unit to assess the operation and identify any potential problems. The exclusion zone is established using temporary metal fencing to maximize internal site security. The zone is enforced by police officers and contractors and council staff who are strategically placed around the perimeter and people may only enter or leave the zone via predetermined zone access points. Elevated platforms are used to maintain security within the zone. Radio checks are carried out regularly to ensure the enforcement of the zone and to identify any problems so they can be resolved quickly. Once the exclusion zone has been enforced, council staff commence the evacuation procedure. The preparation for the evacuation of residents begins three months prior to the blowdown. Information is obtained from each property within the exclusion zone, whether a business premise or residential, to ascertain all details relating to the occupiers, as it's vital to see whether any residents require any support or special needs on the blowdown day in terms of transport, rest centre facilities or medical assistance. One hundred and twenty police officers and support units and a police control unit are employed to ensure that the security within the zone is not diminished by the evacuation of the residents and all properties remain safe and secure during the period of evacuation. One hundred council staff are employed to coordinate the evacuation of seven hundred and fifty residents. All staff are issued with protective clothing and communication equipment. Residents are required to leave the exclusion zone via one of the set exit points so that they can be recorded as having left the zone and issued with identity badges for security reasons. The badges also allow residents early access to the zone following the blowdown. Specialist transport and assistance is arranged for any residents with mobility problems and to meet any particular needs. All residents who live within the exclusion zone must be evacuated before the explosives are detonated. The evacuation is critical to the control team as they must be sure that no one is left within the zone who may influence the blowdown. Areas of scrubland and allotment plots are checked to ensure they are empty. Seismographs and air overpressure monitors are placed to measure the effects of the blowdown. They record ground vibration and blast pressure. It's best if family pets remain within their own home during the blowdown, but some residents feel happier to take them with them. RSPCA personnel are on duty to advise on the welfare of animals. So, 
my papa. Residents who choose to use the rest centre facilities are registered and inducted and given a meal and refreshments. Entertainment is provided for the children. Once the exclusion zone is cleared of all evacuees and council staff return to a point of safety, the detonating initiation system is laid out to the firing point. Final checks are carried out around the perimeter of the exclusion zone and the police helicopter with thermal imaging equipment sweeps the area as a final safety precaution to ensure the zone is empty of all personnel. The control team confirm it is safe to proceed and instructions are given for the countdown to commence. The explosives engineer connects the firing line and... Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ten seconds. Silence commencing. Silence over. Fire! After the building is down, the explosives engineering team must ensure that all has gone to plan. Before giving the all clear, the debris pile is checked. As soon as the area is declared safe, the council street cleansing teams commence the cleanup operation and heavy plant and equipment is brought to site to civilize the rubble pile. Temporary road protection is cleared and the removal of the rubble commences.
Approximately one hour after blowdown, residents are given priority and are checked back into the exclusion zone to return to their homes in advance of the zone being lifted to allow access to the general public. All properties are checked to ensure there has been no damage. <laughs> the demolition of Ryder House was successful and received the ultimate accolade a big thumbs up from the kids. Sandwell MBC would like to thank all tenants and residents affected by the demolition of Ryder House for their cooperation during the project. The demolition of Ryder House is the 20th explosive demolition carried out as part of the regeneration and redevelopment of Sandwell and is the beginning of works on the Greets Green New Deal to provide a better future.